Moving on, what do we have here? Pregnancy, development, from conception to newborn. Ignore this. This is if we were in normal school and we're using the normal book, but we're not. We're using the online book. So the online book has this as chapter six. We can um, organize um, prenatal development into three phases, the early embryonic phase. So this happens from ovulation um, to implantation, right? From, from when the um, egg cell is released to when it's fertilized. And then as it travels down the fallopian tube and it plants itself into the endometrial layer of the uterus. So this is very early on. We're looking at a zygote that's dividing by mitosis, turning from one cells to two, from two to four, from four to eight, from eight to 16. A couple of hundred cells, maybe, maybe a thousand or so by the time it enters into the uterus. Um, once it embeds itself um, th and, and it makes a connection to the mother's blood supply, then we would refer to that as the actual embryonic phase. And this lasts about um, eight weeks until week eight, excuse me. Once it starts to look like an actual person and it's, it's clear that it's a human being, well, then we refer to this as a fetus. So it's entered into the third phase, which is called the fetal phase. And this goes from about nine weeks until it's born. So if we look at the first phase, the early embryonic phase, we can see ovulation just happened here. Um, the fimbriae have, have been moving, um, helping the egg cell to enter into the um, beginning of the fallopian tube. Here we see several sperm uh, uh, cells meeting this egg cell. One of them only will be able to fertilize the egg. And then that fertilized egg is now I can see it's dividing. It looks like two cells, four cells. It when it looks like a um a berry, we refer to this thing as a morula. Morula is a Greek word or a Latin word maybe and it actually means mulberry. Because it looks like a berry at this point. We're still not in the uterus yet. When it's a hollow ball of cells, we call that a blastocyst. And this is what happens about five days after fertilization. So it takes almost about a week for it to travel down the fallopian tubes to enter into the uterus. Implantation happens about day six. And we can see it's beginning to embed itself in the walls. Once it's fully embedded in the walls, phase one is over and we enter into phase two. All right, so preparing the sperm for fertilization. Remember I told you in the last video that the sperm cells have a cap on their head and that cap um, contains digestive enzymes. Well, this cap has to be altered in a way that it can fuse with the egg cell. This alteration of the of the head is called capacitation. Any sperm cell that has not undergoed capacitation will not be able to fuse with the sperm with the uh, egg cell. Um, the acrosomes are going to be activated. They're going to be releasing their digestive enzymes so that the sperm cells can penetrate these protective layers that surround the egg cell. All right, so new life conception begins when that sperm pronucleus fuses with that egg pronucleus. All right, when those two nuclei combine, then we the result is the zygote, which we were all a zygote at one point, which is one cell. We all start as one cell diploid cell. Here's a nice picture because I can see this nice egg cell. 
here I see a, a sperm cell penetrating, even though multiple sperm cells penetrate um, through the protective layer. Here in light blue, this, this protective layer, this is called the zona pellucida. No, I'm sorry, this, this is just fluids. These cells here are left over from ovulation. These cells, when, this, when the egg cell ovulates, they kind of clung to it. These cells make up what's a, um, a cell barrier. You can see the sperm cells have to get through that first. These are the cells of what's called the corona radiata. It's inside that that we have the protein layer of protection called the zona pellucida. All right, so the, the sperm cells that are arriving have to get past the cells of the corona radiata first, and then they use their digestive enzymes to, to burn a hole through this protein layer called the zona pellucida, like this one did. That's the only one that did. And that's the only one that will be allowed to come inside. Only one can penetrate and fuse with the cell membrane of the egg cell. Once this happens, the egg cell will, will finish meiosis, here we see one polar body over here. We'll have another one over here after the, these chromosomes will be discarded, packaged and discarded as, this, as another polar body. The pronuclei from this and the genetic contents from this will fuse to become a zygote. So even though several sperm can penetrate the corona radiata, only one sperm binds with the receptors on the zona pellucida and fertilizes the egg. One human sperm can inseminate only human eggs because there's receptors that, that make sure it's human sperm. Only human sperm can, can fertilize human eggs, right? Sperm from different species can never um, adhere to the cell membrane of the egg cell because the receptors would be different. All right. So again, the secondary oocyte at fertilization would complete meiosis. And then the genetic material inside the sperm cell would enter the uh, cytoplasm of the egg cell. And then the sperm genetic material in the egg genetic material uh, would fuse and then we have our zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg, diploid. This is a great picture here. We see the pronuclei of the sperm cell and egg cell right before they fuse together. We can see what's left over here of the zona pellucida. Here we see one of the polar bodies. Maybe this is the second one. So the zygote has to undergo some changes because remember, it, we all start off as one cell, but we're certainly not one cell now. We're, we're many, many cells. So um, these changes are going to in, include mitosis, right? So it's going to, this is a cell division. As it starts off as one cell and turns into two, uh, this cell is going to experience what's called cleavage. You're going to see clear lines separating the cells, right? And then as these two divide, we'll have another clear division, right? With four cells and then eight cells. And, um, until it starts to look like a ball of cells, right? So we go from a zygote, two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, 32, until we get to that Moriola stage, until we get to a nice looking ball, hollow ball of cells called the blastula. All right, after this, after implantation, we're gonna have what's called differentiation. Differentiation is very important because even though the cells um, are genetically identical, each individual cell is genetically identical. These cells are, are going to start to take on different shapes and assume different functions. All right, we're going to see some cells looking like nerve cells and performing like nerve cells, other cells looking like muscle cells, other cells looking like skin cells.
So the cells have all the same exact genetic material on the inside, but they're taking on different responsibilities, different jobs, and they're taking on different shapes. When we see um, different shapes happening, this is called, there's that word, uh, Genesis again, the creation of morph, right? Shapes. So we're going to see the formation of body tissues and body organs. All right. So we have cells taking on, becoming specialized, performing specific tasks. And we see cells taking on specific shapes that allow them to perform these specific tasks. All right. So with differentiation and morphogenesis happening, we also see growth, right? Growth is an increase in cell, cell numbers. All right. And it causes the organism to increase in size. So we start off as a zygote, but then it divides and divides into a morula. The morula enters the uterus. It continues to divide and divide into what's called a blastula or a blastocyst. This is a hollow ball. It looks like a basketball. You ever look at a basketball up close and it looks like you see all those little dots? This is very similar um, to what a blastocyst looks like. Those little dots would be individual cells. However, if you were to cut this hollow ball of cells open, you would see that there's something called an inner cell mass. It's inner cell mass is very, very important because it's these cells in the inner cell mass that are going to differentiate and become all the cells of the body. So these are stem cells that are going to differentiate into very specific tissues. Outside, the cells of the outside, they're not really going to be part of the body. These outer cells are called the cells of the trophoblasts. And the trophoblast cells are, are kind of important because they're going to help this embryo implant through in, deep into the um, endometrium. But it's really the cells that are inside the, in this inner cell mass that become the body. So this blastocyst is kind of floating around in the uterus until it finds a, a good site where it can embed itself. Here we see nice cleavage happening. You see there's a nice cleavage plane here. So this is two cell cleavage, and then we have four cell, and, and then it would continue, eight cell, 16 cell, 32. So this is the morula phase here. And then the blastocyst or blastula. If we were to cut this open, see the insides, it's these cells in here that make up the inner cell mass. It's these cells in here that will become that will differentiate into specific tissues of the body, right? The other cells that surround all this, all these external cells making up the walls here, these are the cells of the trophoblasts. They don't become the body. So when the blastocyst implants itself in the endometrial wall, that's called implantation. And it has to do that by using enzymes. There's digestive enzymes that are coming out of the cells of the trophoblast that allow this blastocyst to create a channel. It digs a channel and allows it to get deep into that pillowy wall of the endometrial layer of the uterus. All right, these trophoblast cells are going to produce a villi. The villi are going to extend out into the, you know, deep into the walls of the endometrial layer, forming into a structure called the chorion. The chorion is eventually going to become the placenta. So I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. If the blastocyst attaches too high in the uterus, we call that ectopic pregnancy. We said that that pregnancy 
couldn't continue. If it happens too low in the uterus, we have this um, placenta previa developing. So the problem with that is the placenta will grow too close to the cervical opening and will block the birth canal. And that could be dangerous um, for the mother during uh, delivery as well. So this is an interesting factoid. Uh, it is estimated that more than half of the conceptions half do not successfully result in, in actual pregnancy. Here's a great picture. We see that inner cell mass of the blastocyst. So this is the this is going to be the body, right? This is going to be the actual embryo in here. We see trophoblast cells penetrating or resting up against, we should say, the, the cells of the endometrium. So this is the uterine wall right here. What's going to happen is these cells are going to release digestive enzymes, and that's going to help dig a channel. And you can see they're working because this is penetrating that wall. The trophoblast cells are going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Eight days, nine days, 12 days, we see the trophoblast cells differentiating into cells of the chorion, all right? So the chorion are going to start to be produced about 12 days. Here we see the formation of a yolk sac, and then we see um, the formation of an amniotic cavity in here. We see two layers of embryonic disc. Now we've entered into the embryonic stage. We have rapid growth, differentiation, morphogenesis. By the 14th day, we start to see the inner cell mass of the blastula forming into what's gonna be an actual body. This stage is gonna last about from week three to week eight until it starts to look like an actual human, once it starts to look like a little bit like a human, we, we call it a fetus. We enter into the fetal phase. <clears throat> Gastrulation is going to happen. So what's going to happen is that inner cell mass that I was showing you is going to form into three germ layers. The three germ layers from the inside out include the endoderm, which is the inner layer, mesoderm is the middle layer, and then the ectoderm is the outer layer. And it's from these three germ layers that we get all the tissues of the body. It's these cells, stem cells, that are gonna differentiate into epithelial cells, the cells that line your body cavities, right? Connective tissues, your ligaments, uh, bones, blood, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue, all the tissues of the body. This is a very important slide. I would like you to read this. These are the structures that are coming from the ectoderm. It's these structures that come from the mesoderm. And the list is here. I'm not going to read it to you. And the endoderm, the inner layer, is forming these structures. You might see that as an essay question. What's happening with the chorion as we continue here through 18 days? Well, we can see the chorion are starting to extend outward. They're forming these little finger-like projections, right? Last time we saw finger-like projections like this was in the small intestines. We called them villi. These finger-like projections are also called villi, but these are called chorionic villi. Villi are structures that are involved in absorption, right? Just like in the small intestines, the villi were absorbing nutrients. Here, these villi are going to be absorbing nutrients also, but it's nutrients that are going to be absorbed from maternal blood. They're trying to tap into maternal blood and absorb nutrients, oxygen and nutrients, and send it towards the embryo, all right? You can see an allantoasis forming. 
as the Alan Toas is forming, you can see it will become an important part of this structure that will eventually differentiate into what's called the umbilical cord. So those three germ layers are the embryonic membranes. What's happening outside the embryonic membranes? We see the formation of the amnion. The amnion is filled with fluids, that, which is coming from maternal cells, right? Um, what is the function of amniotic fluid? Well, number one, prevents dehydration. Number two, allows space for free movements, maintains stable internal environment, uh, especially because of um, maintaining a, a proper temperature. Remember when we talked about the properties of water, we talked about water having a high specific heat, making it a very stable medium. It takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature, to change the temperature of water. And the fluids help to promote the proper development of the lungs. In addition to the amniotic sac and the amniotic fluid, we have the yolk sac. The yolk sac is important because it's producing blood cells up until there's bone marrow. Once bone marrow is produced, then the bone marrow takes over producing the blood cells. The germ cells are first, are first appearing from the yolk sac. The allantois I showed you after it's formed, that's going to turn into the umbilical cord and the blood vessels that are inside of there. Once the umbilical vessels are fully formed, the allantois will degenerate. The chorion from the trophoblasts, again, are producing these chorionic villi as they extend outward, trying to tap into maternal blood, trying to tap into those nutrients um, that, that, the, that they can send to the developing embryo with ac without actually making blood-to-blood -blood contact. There's a hormone that's being produced by the chorion. It's called human chorionic gonadotropin. Um, this this um, hormone is going to maintain the pregnancy. Much like um, before when we saw the, um, the uterine wall being maintained um, by the release of progesterone, um, we're seeing the pregnancy continuing to be maintained by the release of uh, chorionic and anatropin hormones. Once the placenta is um, fully functioning, the placenta will take over this role uh, of producing progesterone. And then the corpus luteum isn't needed anymore. And then it will slowly degenerate as the placenta produces progesterone in its place. So we have the chorion developing its finger-like extensions, protruding outward, tapping into um, maternal blood vessels. So the chorionic villi form one half of the placenta, specifically the fetal portion of the placenta. The maternal half of the placenta is, um, is supplying blood, right? And it's in that blood that the chorionic villi are going to be absorbing oxygen and nutrients. It's, the, um, it's into that blood that waste products from the developing embryo are going to be uh, removed by diffusion. All right, so we have things going in towards the embryo, things that are good, oxygen, nutrients, and then we have things that are leaving, waste products, carbon dioxide, urea. We've got to get those out. Um, one thing about the placenta is not only is it doing these things that which are important but some other things can cross the placenta things that we don't want right so we have to modify behaviors if we become pregnant because drugs alcohol caffeine and other toxins viruses can cross the placenta and have an effect on the development of the of the embryo so there is never a mix between fetal blood and maternal blood um 
and the mom's blood and baby's blood could be different blood types. So if they ever were to mix, it could be disastrous. So we keep them completely separated. And the placenta acts like a bridge. If we have um, baby's blood on this side and mom's blood over here, the placenta is like a bridge that items can diffuse from one blood supply into another without ever having those two blood supplies come in physical contact with each other. From baby's blood to mother's blood, we would see wastes going in that direction. And then from mom's blood to baby's blood, we would see nutrients, for example, going in this direction, oxygen, that kind of stuff. So here we see a nice dividing line separating the fetal portion. This side is the fetal portion of the placenta. This is the mother's side of the placenta. You see the blood vessels coming in and out. The mom's blood will come in here and um, fill this area with blood. All this area is filled with blood in here, right? These are creating pools of blood. This is all blood, mom's blood in here. Well, the chorionic villi are extending into these pools of blood. And you can see um, the umbilical cord has its own blood vessels. And these blood vessels penetrate inside, the fetal blood vessels do, inside the villi. So it's between this blood here that's supplied by the mother and the blood that's inside the fetal blood vessels that items could be passed back and forth. So the placenta is an extremely important structure when it comes to development. Okay, so when we get to about seven weeks, male and female development is exactly the same with uh, distinct sets of reproductive tools. If there is a Y chromosome present, then the male uh, tubes will become stimulated and uh, testes will develop. If the Y chromosome is absent, then the male tubes will degenerate and ovaries will develop. All right, and we can see there's a color-coded um, five-week undifferentiated stage of the genital uh, tubercle. And we could see the um, homologous structures as one develops into the male reproductive organs and one develops into the female reproductive uh, organs. So the homologies exist in this color-coded um, map, I guess you can say. So it's starting to become increasingly more and more human-like in appearance as we go from weeks five to week eight. And after week eight, as we enter into week nine, uh, what do we have? What do we have? We should have most of the major organs formed. They might not be functioning, but at least they're formed, right? So by this time, we're going to be referring to this. Well, this doesn't look human, but this is 20 days. This doesn't look human. That's 24 days, 32 days. Now we're getting there, right? So 52 days. Now we're getting there. We see clearly there's there's limbs. Uh, the tail is going away. There's eye buds, there's nose, there's ears on the sides. So by the week nine or the end of week eight, we are into the fetal development stage. Fetal development stage is characterized by growth. We see most of our growth happening um, in this stage. Rapid organ growth, rapid organ maturization. Maturation, excuse me. Within seven months, the fetus will grow to an average of about 20 inches and, and should weigh about eight pounds. Can we get information, uh, genetic information? Um, can we analyze chromosomes to see if there's any chromosomal, um, if, see if there's any possibility of chromosomal disorders before we get too deep into development? The earliest we can do that is uh, between weeks 10 and 12 by performing what's called chorionic villi sampling. So this is a little invasive. You have to collect cells of the chorion in order to do that. But we can take these cells and analyze chromosomes. You would do a karyotype, 
really. So you would analyze the chromosomes. You could count the number of chromosomes. Um, but because we could do this procedure between um, weeks 10 and 12, typically that's early enough if, you, if there were going to be serious um, defects that are detected from de performing this karyotype that it would be early enough to allow for uh, an abortion. Around 15 weeks to 18 weeks, uh, there's enough amniotic fluid built up in the amniotic sac that you could collect cells from the amniotic fluid um, that are embryonic cells. Remember, this, this embryo is sitting in, in fluids, and as it's doing so, skin cells are flaking off and now are floating in that fluid. Those skin cells could be collected and analyzed, and we could do a karyotype there. So we can analyze chromosomes and you can see if there's going to be abnormalities, but it's a little bit later. Chorionic VLI sampling could happen the earliest. Um, amniocentesis could also happen, but it happens a little bit later. You would have to use an ultrasound machine. Uh, the ultrasound machine is important because you want to have eyes on the position of the embryo because you are injecting a needle a sharp object into that area. We want to make sure that we keep that away from the body of the developing embryo. So we will, there are cells that are floating around that are belong to this embryo or this fetus that we will collect and we can analyze chromosomes like that. All right. So by the end of the third month, we have a cartilage skeleton that is starting to ossify. Ossify means turn into bone. Kidneys are functioning, liver is functioning, teeth are formed. Um, it's clearly male or female. Second trimester, face begins to resemble its final form. Blood cells are produced by bone marrow and by the liver. Ovarian follicles are forming in the females. Muscular system is developed. Mus uh, nervous system is developed by month five, moving of muscles. You could hear the heartbeat um, just by putting your ear um, outside of the uterus on the belly. You could hear it through the skin. You could hear the heartbeat way before five months with, you know, going into the doctor and using the machine. But they're saying just by putting your ear up against her, you could hear it. There's uh, soft hair that's all over the fetus. It's called the lanugo, and that's fetal hair that's covering the skin. And that'll shed, most of it sheds. Um, even before it's born, but some of it sheds after it's born. Now, uh, by the end of six months, uh, this is a very important thing, surfactant. All right, surfactant is an enzyme that's produced in the lungs, and it's, it's a very detergent-like um, material because what happens is in the lungs when we're breathing, there's these air sacs deep in there called the alveoli. And in the alveoli, as we breathe in, the air sacs become inflated and the walls, um, like a balloon, um, they'll grow, right? They'll expand, the walls will expand. And as we, when, then when we exhale, the walls of the alveoli will go back to their resting position. Now, without surfactant lining those walls, uh, those walls would be sticky and then they would stick together and cling together. This would make breathing very difficult. This detergent like enzyme called surf surfactant that is being secreted in the lungs prevents that from happening. It allows the walls of the alveoli to inflate properly and deflate without the walls sticking together. So this is going to be the determining factor whether or not the baby is really uh, able to survive outside of the uterus, especially if it um, wants to leave early. So it's the, it's the lungs that are the limiting factor, specifically when it comes to the production of 
surfactant. So the last trimester, this we're, now we're talking about month seven, eight, and nine. Again, it's just a lot of growth, a lot of maturation. Eyes are opening and closing, sucking on the thumb. Noises might startle the, the fetus. It's moving. The lanugo is starting to shed. Um, it's building up a, a fatty protective layer. Um, testes are going to descend into the scrotum. And now by the end of week 38, we're kind of ready. We're in a head down position. And the, what the head is doing is it's resting against the cervix and it's going to start to put pressure on the cervix. So we can see a very um, large difference between what things look like at 13 weeks to 26 weeks when it comes to growth. Now, all the other feedback loops to this point have been negative feedback loops. This is our first look at a positive feedback mechanism. And where does it begin? Well, as the head is putting pressure on the cervix, um, we see that the cervix is going to um, stretch. And there are stretch sensitive receptors that are built into of the walls of the cervix that are going to detect that. And they're gonna send nerve signals up to the brain. The control center for the brain, for, for homeostasis, for all of this is always gonna be the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is going to cause the release of um, a hormone called oxytocin. And the effectors for oxytocin are gonna be the walls of the uterus, specifically the muscular walls, the myometrial layer of the uterus. And that's going to cause contractions. When we have contractions happening, it's going to cause the baby's head to put more pressure against the walls of the cervix. So with more contractions and more pressure on the cervix, these signals between the stretch sensitive um, receptor cells in the cervix and the hypothalamus be become stronger and stronger and stronger. And as a result, the contractions become stronger and stronger and stronger until this positive feedback loop is broken. And the only way to break this loop is to pass the baby, right? Um, and we would call that expulsion. All right, so the, all the other feedback loops so far was there's a, there's a disruption in homeostasis and the hypothalamus is going to generate a response to reverse that, right? But here we see feedback coming to the brain and the response is to enhance that or amplify that. Oh, no, there's pressure on the uterus, uh, on the cervix. Oh, yeah, yeah, we want more of that. So we're, we're enhancing the, um, the information, we're, 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 we're making it stronger, we're generating a stronger and stronger response until that, um, until that baby is born. So the first stage of, of all this happening is dilation, right? So that cervical opening is going to get bigger, the mucus plug is going to drop, all right? The mucus plug was there. It was it was it was once sealing the opening of the cervix, right? But once it's drop it, once it drops, now we open that seal. The amniotic sac is going to rupture, and uh, the water we call that water breaking, right? Once the amniotic fluid is gone, then labor is really going to need to begin. So the first stage is when we put pressure here, right? That's dilation. Mucus plug comes out. This cervical opening becomes larger and larger until it becomes large enough through the uterine contractions that expulsion happens. All right, so the expulsion is relatively quick compared to dilation. Dilation could be hours and hours and hours. Expulsion is quick. Um, it starts with crowning, right, head first, and then, you know, followed by everything else. And then we have to wait the last stage of, of uh, the birthing process is the placental stage. The placental detaches itself uh, and is expelled. 
some complications. Yeah, anything between before 37 weeks, right, is going to be considered premature. Respiratory distress syndrome. I told you this is the most important thing happening. And this has to do with not having enough surfactant. Inability to suck or swallow. Sure, that's because the nervous system isn't developed yet. Nutrient intolerance. Sure. Inflammation of the uh, gastrointestinal tract and lining. Kidneys might not be ready. If it comes before 32 weeks, well, the risk of death or long-term disabilities go way up, right? Way up. Sometimes the baby's not head down and uh, the buttocks is um, coming out first. So if that's the case, then that uh, we would have to perform a, a C-section. C-section is when we go um, directly through the skin into the uterus, open the uterus up and remove the baby, lift the baby out. Uh, that could happen when the head is too large or it could happen when we have breech baby or in other emergency type situations. Failure to thrive is something that could happen for a lot of different reasons. There could be medical reasons for failure to thrive. There could be economic or social reasons. There could be psychological factors. If you are depriving the, the child of physical contact or abusing the child, that will cause failure to thrive. When it comes to obtaining nutrients uh, immediately after birth, the so placenta is no longer going to be supplying nutrients. So breast milk is going to be the um, major supplier of nutrients as the placenta is no longer going to be supplying any nutrients. Two hormones are going to be responsible for the production and delivery of breast milk. We have prolactin, and this is going to trigger the milk secretion. All right, so the production of breast milk comes from the production of prolactin from the anterior pituitary gland. Um, breast milk comes first in the form of a watery mm -hmm. fluid called colostrum. The colostrum is very important uh, because it has um, it's rich in proteins and it's rich in antibodies. So when we send antibodies to our uh, baby, this is what's called a passive form of immunity. So these antibodies um, are borrowed, right? And they could um, provide protection of antigens um, uh, from pathogens of a variety, but that protection is uh, temporary, which is why it's important for eventually the baby to receive vaccines, right? The only way to really have active immunity, real immunity, is when you have antibodies of your own. How do we uh, establish antibodies of our own and immunity of our own? Well, we have to either get a vaccine or we have to come in contact with the actual disease. So prolactin is um, responsible for the production of, of breast milk. Oxytocin, which is the same hormone that was um, responsible for the positive feedback loop and the delivery of the baby. Oxytocin is going to be responsible for the release of that uh, uh, breast milk as it uh, stimulates the contractions of the lactiferous ducts. And here we see from the anterior pituitary gland, um, Prolactin, stimulating the production of milk, and then from the post pit, oxytocin, releasing um, that milk. Just remember, pro, lactin, milk, pro, production, production, prolactin. All right. This is the end of the presentation.